Here's one passage where he basically paints Jesus as a poor bastard who learned magic in Egypt in order to deceive everyone into believing he was a god. For he, that is Celsus, represents him. This him is a Jew who interrogates Jesus in Celsus's work, disputing with Jesus and confuting him as he thinks on many points. And in the first place, he accuses him of having invented his birth from a virgin and upbraids him with being born in a certain Jewish village of a poor woman of the country who gained her subsistence by spinning and who was turned out of doors by her husband, a carpenter by trade, because she was convicted of adultery. That after being driven away by her husband and wandering about for a time, she disgracefully gave birth to Jesus, an illegitimate child, who having hired himself out as a servant in Egypt on account of his poverty, and having there acquired some miraculous powers, on which the Egyptians greatly pride themselves, returned to his own country, highly elated on account of them, and by means of these proclaimed himself a god. So here we have a detractor of Christianity, and that means that Jesus had to exist, or Celsus would not have been attacking him, right? Again, Celsus is criticizing Christians and their beliefs. And by the time he wrote his critique of Christianity, the gospel details had been circulating for quite some time. Whether Celsus actually thought Jesus was historical is meaningless. His knowledge of Christianity comes from what Christians said, not what he saw with his own eyes over 140 years earlier. Having been written around the year 177 CE, a full 140 years after Jesus' alleged death, Celsus's criticism comes much too late to be meaningful as evidence for historical Jesus. Mara Bar Serapion was a Stoic pagan living sometime between 72 CE and the 4th century. That certainly narrows it down, doesn't it? A copy of a letter he wrote to his son is preserved in a 6th or 7th century manuscript and is sometimes cited as independent evidence of Jesus' existence and death. Here's the relevant text. What else can we say? When the wise are forcibly dragged off by tyrants, their wisdom is captured by insults, and their minds are oppressed and without defense. What advantage did the Athenians gain from murdering Socrates? Famine and plague came upon them as a punishment for their crime. What advantage did the men of Samos gain from burning Pythagoras? In a moment, their land was covered with sand. What advantage did the Jews gain from executing their wise king? It was just after that, their kingdom was abolished. God justly avenged these three wise men. The Athenians died of hunger. The Samians were overwhelmed by the sea, and the Jews, desolate and driven from their own kingdom, live in complete dispersion. But Socrates is not dead because of Plato. Neither is Pythagoras because of the statue of Juno, nor is the wise king because of the new law he laid down. First of all, since we have no idea when this was actually written, it's of little use as evidence for historical Jesus. One thing is for sure, it could not have been written before 72 CE, for it references the destruction of Jerusalem. But as the first gospel, Mark, could also not have been written until after the war, this letter, if genuine and not tampered with, would simply have to have been written much later than 72 CE to allow for the gospel version to spread into Syria, the homeland of the author, since he makes a clear reference to the gospel story of the Jews demanding Jesus to be killed, and the reference to the wise king also hinting at the sign above Jesus' head that read King of the Jews, or some variation depending on which gospel you read. Since we can't verify the date of authorship, and it sounds as if this was written well beyond 72 CE, this writing is of little value in our quest. The Babylonian Talmud is another one you might encounter as evidence for Jesus, but this set of documents was compiled from the 3rd to 5th centuries, and as such, is far too late to provide any independent corroboration, since by that time, 
any non-Christian would have been aware of the stories and simply echoing what the Gospels claimed, or in this case, corroborating the non-miraculous version of a Jesus who did not exist but was merely killed and hung. And that was that. Obviously, Jews living in late antiquity were not going to be corroborating the Messiah and miracle parts of the Gospels. That's it. What you've just seen is the sum total of evidence for Jesus' existence in the non-biblical writings all the way into the third century. This evidence, or should I say lack of evidence, lines up more precisely with a seminal early belief that Jesus was in fact a heavenly being killed in heaven at the beginning of time and later brought back to life by another heavenly being, Yahweh. Only later do we find a Roman Gentile writing a hero biography about this heavenly Son of God walking around on earth in the style of the roaming prophets of the day, perhaps modeled in part on the teacher of righteousness and other hero figures. Years later, Matthew would clone Mark's gospel, filling in details of Jesus' resurrection in his own way, because as we learned earlier, his copy of Mark likely did not even have a post-resurrection account. Silence in the secular record about the Jesus we find in the Gospels. It's what we would expect if the Gospels were later fictions about the heavenly Jesus of the earliest Christians. In the next video, I'm going to take a look at the actual resurrection accounts themselves. Do the Gospels corroborate each other? See you there.